here's, here's a good question. Um, we've got a sort of a kick snare sound yep. together, so I'll just give you a bit more of that. That was um, compressed on the way in. Um, do you ever do any of that kind of thing? I, I do. So I, when I, uh, when I record drums, I'll have, for example, the kick mics, however many combinations of kick mics come up on the console, and then they get sent to the bus that they're recording to. They also send to another bus that yeah. goes to a compressor, so I'll parallel compress things on the way in. Yes. As, the, yes. as its own instrument. So, for example, a kick drum for me might be a microphone, a microphone, and then a very heavily compressed, uh, compressed parallel channel. Right. And then that gets fed back into the record bus. So that's printed with the track. It's not separate. It's, yeah. It actually becomes the kick drum sound. Yeah. And usually for me, a kick drum will go through 1176 on the, the old buttons in. Yeah. So it's really spitting and aggressive and full of air. And then as you feather that in, the kick just goes from being kind of as it is now, a natural, normal, balanced kick to suddenly having this this voice and this sort Bang. of assertiveness. And I, yeah, I do that on the kick and on the snare. Uh, really only those two things. Um, and I've been doing that for, for quite a long time. Do you print a dry or do no, you? No, no, it's just, just that. Just always print that. And I just, just print all the kicks Brave. together, all the snares together. So, um, well, let's have an, another quick listen to that, um, that compressed. It and it's great. quite like slammy, isn't Definitely, it? Definitely, yeah. Um, I think I just went a bit wild with it. Uh, but that was, a, that was a really nice toy at, at, sure. at the studio, just to kind of like, Hey, yeah, go yeah, on, yeah. just choose that to flavour. I really like using those things in, in specific sections of songs. So second verses, for example, killing all the rest of the drums and just dropping through for, for maybe for four or eight bars to that really heavily compressed, quite small but exciting sounding yeah. channel. And it just gives the song a, 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 it gives you like a free lift when the rest of the yeah, drums come back in. Yeah, when it comes in. back exactly, in, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's a great idea. And if people want to do that in the multi-tracks when they're mixing yep. this, obviously we're fortunate enough to be working on a big desk here. I've done a little bit of EQing on a couple of the things, but nothing massively of note. Uh, there's nothing really extreme in yep. there. Let's talk about the Versed mic, um, cool. which is that mic that was coming in across the top of the kit. You could almost have this as a sound on its own on some records. Mine you? never sound like this, you know. <laughs> I abandoned doing any of these kind of special <laughs> trashy mics because they never sound like that. They just <laughs> might just sound like trash. So I'm interested how that why, how, how that's happened. Well, we've got a full breakdown of that. Okay, I'll have to, where can I find that? <laughs> you know, a really good little trick that I fell upon for this is I always basically mix. I'll mix most of a tune with the toms out. And it's only towards the very, very, very end that I'll yeah. feather the toms in because all the high end information from your cymbals and your vocal guitars, you've kind of decided and that's all there. So then you can really gauge how much of that high end you really need on the tom mic. So a lot of it's already there in, in other sounds. Yeah. And then you, the, the, thing, the, the problem when you do it early on, when you bring the toms in from the start of the mix is that you add top end to them to make them sound exciting. You bring out all that cymbal wash. So actually, if I yeah. restrain them until the very, very end, as I tuck them up, you kind of go, well, I don't really need to add top end because it's coming from somewhere else. So those cymb that bleed, you can't even hear the contribution to the mix anyway. You can see on the screen here that there's not really that much no. in terms of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven fills yeah. in the whole song. And you know, so it's worth going through manually chopping if you, those. If out you have if the real fast one is if you have Pro Tools with clip gain or clip effects on it, spend five minutes creating yourself a custom curve yes. with with a the high end roll off so it so that you can take, for example, the cymbal hit and you can say, okay, it's going to do a, high, a low pass filter and take off a load of the high end and drop the volume by so much and put yeah. a curve on it. And you can program that to one number key. So I just now fly through, one, 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 and you Ooh. can do it. And you actually, your I fade see. also has an EQ roll off in it that rolls off, well, that way that rolls off the top yeah. end. And so you could do a track of toms in less time than it's taken me to explain it there. <laughs> I'll be looking at that later. Pro, what is it called? Clip, <laughs> clip, clip effects presets. Go. Overheads. Yep. I didn't. Were they? I think they were uh, coals. They sounded really off good. Off the top of my head. Um, so, well, do you know what sounded great? The drummer. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> the drummer exactly. was just brilliant. Good kit. Um, they have that coalsy, that snare kind of bonk. That's <laughs> the way you yeah. describe it. And it's a, it was a nice tight snare. Yeah. I was a little worried about the amount of low end, but. Um, Sounds great. We brought this. We brought the snare up, didn't yeah. we, earlier? And and I said, oh, I'm a little worried about the amount of low end in it. And I'll just grab an EQ and says, oh, tch, bang. Yeah. Great sounding EQ. Even if you're working in the box, you can still do this. You know, 
a boost around 200 somewhere I'd, I'm there. usually I'll find every every track I do has normally got a lot of 100 a huge yeah. great big boost at 100 yeah, all the time on snares but I like that really like dense I like the snare to have as much yeah. authority as the kick drum really yeah. tell me why you laid this out the bass out on two tracks Neck and, uh, two, well, two channels well sorry. I stole this from, from Michael Brower years ago <laughs> he brings his bass out on two faders and he treats one as what he calls the neck and one as what he calls the body yeah. so really one the neck is you you use inserts or you sort of define that as uh, the articulation of the bass mm -hmm. when he says the neck I think he means the musical notes of it the B the bass or the bottom body sorry mm -hmm. is literally the sub and the low end yeah. and I, the way I do it, I choose an insert so I usually put like a DBX 160 on the neck because it adds a sort of hardness to it mm -hmm. makes the bass just sound kind of compact and yeah it helps it just pop out the speakers a little bit more right um, and then I'll usually EQ into that a little bit as well so add a bit of mid-range wherever the bass has that sort of resonance that you know the sort of speaking sound to it I'll push that in there and mm -hmm. then the bot the body um, usually go it'll be a change all the time it can be a 1176 or a distressor or if I have one an LA2 just something really smooth in the bottom end and that's usually what I'll add low end to and right. then I find when I'm mixing the bass rather than if I need to mold it into the track rather than using it on one fader and going to EQ yeah and have to be quite fiddly with it it's easier for me to just do that and sort of lean it low end lean it mid-range on and top end mm -hmm. so it's kind of like having a more global eq under your faders and i really like changing the changing up in the song cool. so, in, so in the chorus for example i might bring the low end in more or in certain sections i might even mute the high end and rely on the low end yeah and it's just a way to have a little bit more control or color really as to how the yeah. how the bottom end sounds Let's have a listen to that. Then. Sure. Well, this is just the dry for now. Just the dry, yeah. And we're but gonna the inserts are ready to go in, I think. Are they ready? Well, yeah, there should be. Yeah, there, yeah. cool. Um, we're on cut on this. Let me just. Yeah, the inserts there. Bay. Oh. oh, sorry. Oh. So. Okay, so this is just the DI. Yeah, this is, and these are coming out of the both faders equally. Yeah. So same source. Yeah. Go on then. So. Do your thing. If you insert that, mm -hmm. that now has the DBX on it. And the idea, I mean, do what you want with it, but I like the DBX to be kind of hitting it a bit. Yeah. I'm not too shy with it. More? You can go more. Go for it. So the idea, you'll find a point where you want the bass to just feel really dense and solid. So are you EQing this, this will neck? Be. Not right now, so, so yeah. at the moment, no. I'm gonna slide over. But you kind of get a free mid-range boost yeah. from that compressor anyway, just because yeah. it, it tightens things. And then I will, I basically look for where the, 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 the guitar sort of speaks really. So where's the frequency that it really just comes to yeah. life? And then I'll boost a little bit like that. Because there's a lot of growl on this, exactly. isn't it? The and way you played it and everything. Yeah, and it's really useful. And so I'll boost into that. And then the bottom end, which right now we're going through um, a distressor, which is on the Opto. And you're just EQing present. on the desk EQ. Yeah. There's yeah, no, yeah. no nope. fancy stuff going Not on. Have all. we got any plugins on here? Uh, nope. Nothing. It's literally just. Yeah. So then the distressor. The So the idea with this is I don't compress this too hard. I don't like limiting the bottom end too much. Yeah. Just enough that it kind of, again, adds that density. Mm -hmm. And then you would. Oh. That's nice. where you get all that low end. Yeah. And then what's really cool is if you place the EQ, the uh, compressor after the EQ, then you can kind of make, you can create that yeah, sense of bloom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where the yeah. bottom end is just really cohesive. Lovely. And then. Go on then. So okay. without so all that. Sounds like that. Beautiful. And then just as you balance the faders, so you can kind of sculpt just that. The, just the neck. Yeah. And then just the yeah, just the subby base, the body. Yeah. And then in context. A little bit loud in context. Oh, yeah. And we can bring those others back in, I guess. Um, oh, they're actually over here.
And that kind of really fills up the, the spectrum, yeah. doesn't yeah. it? it? Fills up the frequency spectrum. So. And I like doing things where if you have a run on the bass, for example, something that's interesting, oh, you, you can push just it. push the neck yeah. up a little. You don't need to push the bottom end, but you can just favour the neck for that. That's a really good point, actually, yeah. isn't it? Because like, automating bass can be quite radically changing. Absolutely, to yeah. The... yeah. And I'll automate it a lot as well, usually with the group so that notes that are too loud I'll tuck in and the, the, the sustain, so for example there, that note kind of dies yeah. off on the sustain, so rather than compressing it too hard, yeah, just... which when you compress it, you have to you get like kind of artifacts and unless it's a really, really, really super perfect recording, yeah. you usually fight battles then, so I'll do more manual riding than I will yeah. compressing to keep it even. I always believe that every sound in a mix should have a very focused purpose. Yes. And you should, the way I mix is to sort of try and define what each thing is bringing to the table. And, yeah. if, and so, for example, that guitar, that low end rumble might be cool in isolation in here, and it might be more authentic to the sound, but then in the context of what, you're, what you want that guitar to serve in the mix, does that low end add anything of value? No, no, Some, no. But actually sometimes it does, and you, I see a lot of younger engineers and they'll just high pass everything, push, 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 and there's no low end on anything, and there's no real physicality yeah. to the mix, and it's very sort of sterile and clean, and it's fine, but it doesn't really move you and move any air. I, th I think you have to kind of, when you're high, doing that sort of lots of high pass filtering, mm. you have to think about like, what is extraneous noise and what is intended. Absolutely, and that, yeah. that decision is, yeah. is where you, so, well, let's have a listen to this, this guitar. What would you do with this guitar? Uh, for me, I would, I would bring mid-range into that. So I would make That's that guitar really more. come in front of me. If I'm on the right channel. So you could push it up a bit more. I would even start digging in here. Oh, green band. I mean, it's it's a it's a weird track because it's it's just the one guitar. Sure, yeah, Normally, yeah, yeah. like we yeah. have like multiple yeah, 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 guitars, yeah. but I kind of decided to leave it like this and just add the cheesy lead yeah. that we're going to reamp in a minute. Yeah. And because the organ's taking up a bit of space in it uh, and, sure. and such like. Um, and this is the thing, though, is that the organ is, has a, a fairly similar frequency content to a guitar. So they're, yeah. they're fairly related. So if the guitar is left kind of thick and and you know flat in our terms, then that's fine, but is it gonna, are we gonna start getting some blending with the organ? Does the organ actually have more of that pad feel to it? Yeah. More of the harmonic content? I believe it does. The guitar's more articulate. The guitar's actually got a rhythmic element that the organ won't have. So I would think of the guitar more like a rhythmic part to, yeah, to fit with it. Yeah, yeah, and, and let, it, let it fit with the snare, the hats mm. and the kick more than anything. Yeah. Hey, welcome to recordproduction.com. I am here in the lovely Motor Museum studios with Mr. Al Groves, record producer, mix engineer, extraordinaire, and now owner of the Motor Museum. Yep. And this amazing SSL duality, uh, which we sit in front of. Um, so tell us about how, uh, how did you, well, we've, I think we've talked about how you got started at the Motor Museum, sure. but a brief recap of like, why are you just buying it now? <laughs> I've been saving, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. Um, so I moved in in 2012 as a leaseholder, and I, actually it was offered to me in around 2014. Yeah. Uh, Andy, the landlord, uh, or the ex-landlord, came to me and said, um, for, for reasons, personal reasons, if, it's not for sale, but if ever I decided I'd like to buy it, he would love it to, to, it to go to me, basically. But there's no pressure, it's not, it's not gonna be for sale unless I come to him and say, I'd love to buy it. And that, obviously, at the time I couldn't do that just purely for financial reasons and um, I didn't really have the, the stability and the sort of, the accounts to show that, I, that this was gonna work for me. And then fast forward to uh, about a year ago, so this time last year in 2020, and um, I sort of was having a conversation with my wife and thinking, this, you know, the pandemic and things have obviously caused you to think about your future a little bit more and have a look at what you've got and you know what, what, what you want life to look like, basically. Mm. And I thought, I never really want to leave the Motor Museum. I really, really love it. Very fond of it, and it, it's very much me as a, as a working facility. And we have our house two miles away on the side of the park, and we have our lovely little family and things. And I thought, that's the last piece of the puzzle, really, for me to say, that's me set for life then. Do you know, making records in Liverpool is great. Yeah, I'm not absolutely. just saying that because I'm from the, the nearby. Yeah. Um, but it is cool, isn't it? We're on this sort of... Yeah. Uh, 
very European feeling street full yeah. of restaurants and yeah. bars. Sure. Uh, we're just off the side. We're hidden in this lovely, lovely area. There's an incredible park yeah. just at yeah. the end of the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can see why you don't want to move. Yeah. Um, so it came about and yeah. you, you got the motor museum and then decided you needed a, a, a desk upgrade. Well, uh, oh. that, that was never part of the original plan. Um, the original plan when I, when I made the agreement to, buy, to purchase everything, the, the building and all the contents last mm. year, was, and that, the conversation was, I love the Neve, the previous console, and I'm going to keep that because why would I yeah. change it? And I really, really like it. And there isn't another console on the market that really, unless I spend a lot of, or find something like a duality, yeah. there isn't anything I would go to that would give me any sort of advantage. So that's, that's basically it. And then... Um, as I started to feel that, so I, I think actually I did a couple of mixes on the Neve that just really weren't suited, suited to that yeah. console, to that sound, to that workflow. And they were things that, had they gone my way, they would have been really good uh, door openers for me. So I was right. kind of frustrated that I didn't yeah. get, they didn't happen the way I wanted. And I really felt like the, it was my fault it didn't happen, but my, the, I'd come to the end of my time on that particular console mm -hmm. in terms of what I could do with it and yeah. what, what future yeah, yeah. that I could hold with it. So I started to think about, it was actually an old SSLG or you know, something like that maybe. And then this became available. This used to belong to Pete Townsend and mm. it was marketed by a broker who I knew, had a good relationship with. The price was um, just about feasible, yeah. uh, <laughs> just about. And I, it, was, it almost didn't happen. It, it took about six months from me making my initial interest for, for to actually close in and mm. it was three or four times and it wasn't gonna go ahead and you know, and then finally it did. And I just wanted to do something really special and to, come, to sort of say, well, I, although I said the perch in the building was the last piece in the puzzle for me, <laughs> actually what I really meant was a, a console was the very, very last thing. And, well, sometimes it's nice as well to have something that's had, like you could have, if you'd have, it looks brand new sure. to me, yeah. um, but sometimes it's nice to have something that's had that heritage. Absolutely. And then there's that talking point, isn't it? Absolutely. That studio. Yeah. Thought, hey, guess what? This exactly. Used to, you know. Well, I mean, the Neve had a bit had, of magic imbued into this. Me. Is, this is it. I mean, the Neve had a, a real good sort mm. of um, you know credibility and list of, of records on it, and that was you know there's a little bit of a fondness to that yeah. with it as well. So. It's fantastic that this also has a great sort of heritage yeah. to it and it's got some really good records to its name and it really makes sense with the ethos of the building and the sort of, just the, yeah. know, the vibe itself. Yeah. And I think um, when I say I want to do something special, I also realise that my career has only ever been in recording in, in, in the production industry and I'm very grateful for that and I, and I sort of realise that investing in that is... It, it obviously benefits me, but it's the right thing to do for the sort of yeah. the recording industry itself. It shows how sure. valuable these things are, how valuable studios are, and the people. And I'm not getting rich off these things, but I'm filling my time and you know being able to have the tools I want to be able to yeah. fulfil my vision for what I want my career to reflect. Really. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And are you finding, like, you've got dynamics mm. coming out your ears, <laughs> haven't you? And channels <laughs> yeah. galore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're doing more on here rather than outboard you were saying yeah well i really like the sound of everything on yeah. it to be honest so there are one or two outboard pieces that are very specific sounding yeah. that'll stay but generally you know there's no there's hardly any inserts hanging off it mm. um it, the desk is just there and, and actually with it, it it's it sounds so good this is one of the great things about that i really like about this particular one is that it just sounds really big so you don't have to carve things the way that I used to. I don't have to be queuing now to fit something through the mix yeah. bus, yeah, even yeah, though the old yeah. mix bus had a cool sound to it and it was yeah. great when you learned how to hit it, but you had to be very careful about what you shoved into it because yeah. it would collapse. Whereas this, it's got so much headroom and so much depth and range to it that you can just use volume to find, to find the space or something. Yeah. You don't have yeah, to yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, sure. mutilate it really. Yeah. Um, so it's, I'm very happy. Yeah, well, um, what about clients? Are they loving it? I uh, hope so. <laughs> yeah, good, good. So far, so far. Good. Um, I can imagine the look on their faces when they come back in after the previous, and yeah. it just looks so different. Like the vibe of the studio is so much more open. Yeah. But you got new speakers as well. Yeah, yeah. So we changed these. Um, the, we've moved everything over to Genlec now, and, and actually every room in the building is now on Genlec, just right. through, uh, I think, a testament to how good they are, really. Yeah. Um, the, the These 8351Bs are just absolutely remarkable, and I went into changing speakers very, very cautiously, and I was quite reluctant, really, to, to go down that path, yeah. but knew that I needed to have a bit of a change for, to sort of motivate me out of some ruts. I don't think you can go wrong with Genlec, to oh. be honest. No. The, there's a, the, 
they don't look like huge either. No. Do they? They're so <laughs> capable, they're just though. like enormous sound. The, the, what I've learned, what they've told me about them, is there's some really, really clever design and engineering in them that that mean that they don't need a big box to create yeah, yeah. to create the image that you expect. They sound more like main monitors really yeah. um, than they do near fields. And the way we have them is obviously it's not in the near field position at all. And they're just remarkably good. And the combination of how they sound in the room to sort of motivate it to work and how they translate out of the room yeah. is, is just spectacular. I've not really ever heard any, any monitoring like it. Um, and then how, you know, with the console, and, and you're right, the, the, we've completely redesigned the room, so it's a much more open yeah, layout it's now. Just, it's such a cool vibe. Yeah, and I think it's really right good. Through, That's the right, control, yeah. Uh, the library and stuff. And yeah, and everything was rewired, so all the, when the console changed, all yeah. the audio, every every audio connection in the building has been rewired. It sounds super crisp. So it does, it does, and it all works. Um, and it was... Yeah, a labour of love. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> How many thousand connections? A lot. A yeah. lot. Who knows? Well, lot. what's next then? Um, so, uh, a lot more of the same. Yeah. But I feel like everything is kind of. The, the, there's a little injection of steroids to my a lot of it, my, my confidence yeah. and my sort of motivation yeah, yeah. is through the roof right now. Um, I'm now really enjoying every mm. every record I make, every mix I do, everything I track on here. Yeah. It's just a, it's a pleasure and it's pushing me more and more and I, I sort of have this really empowering feeling in the morning to go, no matter what I do today, everything is going to sound better than it did six months ago yeah, on the previous yeah. console because I have this tool in front of me that just factually sounds better. Yeah. So And my skills are only improving every day as well. That's a good good way of thinking. About exactly, it. you know, there is no no matter what I, I could I could go to work and have a bad day and it's still going to sound better than it did six months yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, and then we're doing some some wider refurb around the building, so there's a new kitchen um, in the next fortnight, I think, and then you know we'll redecorate out in the in the lounge and. It's just, such a cool building as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. Um, I think no. I just want to preserve. It's got so much character and so much yeah. history into it that yeah, what yeah, I yeah. don't want to do is is disrupt any of that. Yeah. I just want to keep it feeling looked after. Sure. So, let's say someone sees this and yep. they go, ah, he's the man for me, I want to work with Mr. L. Groves at the Motor Museum in Liverpool. Yep. How, do they, how do they find you? You can, um, you can go to the motor www.themotormuseum.com yep. and that's for the studio website. You'll be able to find a link to me on there or um, you can email me directly at al at themotormuseum.com or you can go via my management. There's a guy called Pip Newby at Friends vs. Music um, and he looks after me as a, as a producer and a mixer and he can connect us as well. Awesome. Mr. Al Groves, the amazing Motor Museum studio and his incredible duality. Get down here, book a session. <laughs> Thank you.